Our speaker starting off for us today is Brother Dennis Skip Francis. He's been preaching for about 20 years. He's done local work in several areas of the United States and Canada. He's done uh, foreign preaching of the gospel in England for the past three years, being involved in the English lectures. He is also an instructor in the Truth Bible Institute, and he's involved in substitute teaching in public school there where they live. He has two bachelor degrees, bachelors of science in management computer information systems. Um, does that cover both of them? <laughs> he and his wife Kay have three children still at home, Sean, Brian, and Mary, and one uh, grandchild, Lorena. Skip's currently doing local work, Grant Street Church of Christ in Moonland, Kansas. <laughs> Liberal Kansas. So we're very glad that Skip is with us. We look forward to hearing him speak this morning on a gathered people. And I think it'll be interesting just to hear the meaning of that. So come speak to us. I'll begin this morning by addressing my gratitude to the elders here at Spring and, and as well as Brother Brown for continuing to invite me to participate in this lectureship. It's, it's kind of the, one of the highlights of my year to be able to come here, and, and not only because of the, the soundness of this congregation, but the, the uh, ability it affords me to touch base with so many uh, good friends in the Brotherhood. Uh, one of the things I determined not to do this morning, because I know it kind of got started yesterday, but I decided that in the spirit of fellowship and, and friendship and peace that I was not going to say anything about Terry Hightower. <laughs> of course, Terry does enough of that all by himself. So, uh, I, I want to especially thank the Cones for uh, continuing to uh, not only put up with me, but uh, th this year I was able to bring the family with, or at least part of it. Uh, when you have as big a family as we do, it's difficult to get them all out at once. So, but we're, we're certainly pleased to be here. And uh, I can't say enough about these kinds of lectureships and the need for them today. You know, as the, the change agents and the false teachers just seem to be multiplying in, like rabbits in leaps and bounds. The uh, illustration I guess I would use, because it's one of the ones that, uh, that always seems to, uh, to happen, uh, many of us are on internet lists, and you've heard us talk about them before. And one of the things that frequently happens is someone will send a, a letter or note to the internet list and say, does anyone know of a sound congregation in this place? And the silence is deafening. And the reason is because today there are so few sound congregations in this country. And, and that's one of the reasons why these things need to be done. We need to deal with these problems and need to bring whatever we can bring the church back to what it should be. Of course, now, this should be no surprise to those of us that, are, that study history and try to learn the lessons of history. When we, we go back and we look at both the history and Bible times of the Lord's people as well as as uh, right up to modern times, we continue to see the same kinds of issues, the same kinds of problems arise that we read, for instance, about the seven churches of Asia. We've also had many men in modern times that have rather prophetically talked about these issues. You know, some of us remember those famous quotes, uh, J.D. Tant is a good example of that, brethren, we are drifting. And of course, the many different people that have said that we're only one generation away from apostasy. We have been warned. Still, and sadly, there are many today in the church that will not stand for the doctrine of Christ even when it virtually slaps them on the face. It seems with some that as long as there is a Church of Christ sign on the door, and no instrument in the building, almost anything else is acceptable. And of course, as many of us know, the instrument is becoming less and less of an issue as well as the name of the church. 
many of our brethren will continue to identify congregations or preachers that they used to know as sound, even though these congregations and preachers now practice many things that have no authority in the Word of God. They teach things that are opposed to God's mandates, and they bid God speed to error by virtue of inappropriate fellowship. If there is so much that is error being taught to our brethren, it's all the more important that these errors be exposed. It was rightly said many years ago that forewarned is forearmed. And brethren, we need to be armed. This is warfare. And it's warfare for the souls of man. In case you think that these lectures have little impact, just go back and look at the archives from last year's lectures. And notice the number of, well, shall we say, well-known men that, that got real involved and got real concerned about what we were doing here. It's our hope that they will continue to be offended. And better yet, that they'll repent. Amen. The title of the book under review is called A Gathered People. Revisioning the assembly as transforming encounter. By the way, Brother Al Maxey, if you're watching, I read the book. I, I just wanted you to know that. Uh, you know, it was also rightly said to err is human and to really mess things up requires a committee. Well, it's kind of interesting when you stop to think about that because a committee generally, you can't even call it a committee until there's at least three people involved. And, we had a committee that wrote this book. And of course, the kinds of things they wrote were not a great surprise to many of us when we consider the background of, of the men that wrote it. The first and probably the ringleader of this effort is the former minister of education of the Woodmont Hills Family of God in Nashville, Tennessee, John Mark Hicks. Of course, uh, he also headed similar efforts in, in two other subjects that he covered when he attempted to revision those things. We remember, of course, Woodmont Hills as the former congregation of Brother Rubel Shelley, who has always been at the forefront of liberalism, as Brother David so aptly defined it not long ago. But you know, it's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Brother Hicks, as he's also been at the forefront of liberalism at apostate schools and lectureships all over the Lord's church, not to mention his habit of fellowshipping those who are also far gone from the truth. Hicks received his postgraduate education at Westminster Theological Seminary, a Presbyterian school. And that appears to have affected him quite greatly. In a similar way, the second writer that we'll mention is John Melton, and he received his graduate degree from Erskine Theological Seminary, another Presbyterian school. Now, the third writer, of course, uh, he got his degree, his postgraduate degree from a school more familiar to us. It's not, uh, wasn't, at least when it was founded, a denominational school, but Brother Hicks taught there. <laughs> And uh, Harding University Graduate School of Religion, of course, has had a great deal of denominational influence over the years. And that influence is not only apparent in the underlying structure of this book, it's also obvious in the citations that they use in the more liberal chapters, many of which are men from Catholicism, from the Baptist Church, as well as the Presbyterian Church. Now, I think it was aptly mentioned yesterday, and I'll say it again, it is doubtful whether the Lord's church needed another book on the subject of worship. Of course, you know, you always wonder why they don't choose the right book. I've wondered that for a number of years, especially when I see so many brethren going out and buying these self-help books when they've got the best self-help book ever written. Hopefully they do. And they should be able to, by now, rightly divide it. As we look at their take on the subject of worship, consider the following. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. 
Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. John chapter 4, verse 19 to 26. I thought as I began to review this book, I'm going to read the title once again so that you can really understand how I was, what my, what my thinking was when uh, Brother David uh, first called me and, and asked me to participate in a lectureship. Of course, I, I agreed to do that. But it was only then that he told me the title of this book that I was supposed to review. Now, though I was familiar with the name of at least two of these authors and had heard of a previous book reviewed last year by Brother Johnny Oxendine, I had not read any of their writings personally before, except, of course, an extract from the lectureship. So when Brother Brown told me I was doing a a lesson, a manuscript on the subject of a gathered people revisioning the assembly as transforming encounter, I immediately responded, it sounds to me like a doctoral thesis for a PhD in psychobabble. And that's just what it sounds like. And you know, brethren, one of the things that, uh, uh, that I know that sometimes we can do today, we can judge a book by its cover. Often such books as this use terminology that my grandmother would have called highfalutin. Uh, well, I guess as one that likes to uh, dabble in sleight of hand, some of you know that I have an interest in stage magic and, and, uh, and I like to play around with that. It's been a hobby since I was about 12 years old. I would really refer to this as smoke and mirrors. Because one of the things that I, that I know about magic is that, especially guys that do a lot of stuff with cards, well, what they like to do before they start doing their regular card tricks is they kind of like to dazzle their audience with their dexterity with the cards. They do a lot of these one-handed cuts and fans and various other flourishes that frankly serve the purpose of baffling the audience. There are a number of words in this book that are designed to baffle the audience. As a matter of fact, there are some that cannot be found in any dictionary. Some are extrapolations of real words, but they're really made up words. Words like enculturation, and its corollary, enculturated. Now I looked them up, I couldn't find them in any dictionary I could find. I know what they're trying to say, but in addition, they also have a penchant for these high-sounding religious terminology rather than the simple and pure words of God. They begin using such terminology right from the very beginning of the book in the introduction. Of course, as we'll talk about a little bit later, such terminology as sacrament and sacramental are very important to them. Now, they suggest that this term is a part of the, quote, historic church's use. Well, I always wonder what folks like that mean when they talk about the historic church. Because the historic church began in the first century. The term sacrament was coined by Augustine of Hippo in the fourth century, and he defined the term as an outward and temporal sign of an inward and enduring grace. Now it's used much this way by the authors to suggest that the Lord's Day worship is an outward or, and I quote, external symbol through which God acts to give grace to his people. This idea of an outward sign of an inward grace is a term that denominationalists have used for years to try to downplay the saving nature of baptism though they can't find even one Bible passage that ever says anything like that. As I considered their belief 
in the historic church. And I noticed a number of times that they referred to the Stone Campbell movement. And I know that a lot of you in the books that you're looking at have seen the same terminology used. Brethren, guess what I found? There really are Campbellites out there. They're these folks, these liberals that want to attach everything to the Restoration Movement or the Stone Campbell Movement, as they call it. This term seems to be more important to them than membership in the body of Christ. They mention several times in the introduction, and they say, and I quote, part of our challenge as heirs of the Stone Campbell Movement is to reconnect discipleship and sacramentalism. And by the way, is that really a word? And it is consonant with, even demanded by our heritage to do so. Brethren, the only thing that we're going to inherit if we're faithful Christians is we're going to inherit heaven. And we're going to inherit, be able to sit jointly with Christ. As we look at the terminology that these three men seem to love, there are also a number of such cloudy terms throughout the book. They refer in one case to the Apostle Paul's doxological life, when they could have said a life of praise, because that's what it meant. Would the average Christian understand terminology like the reformed regulative principle or the liturgical reformed tradition? What purpose do words like anthropocentric, theocentric, and reductionistic serve? Except, of course, it makes the one doing the writing sound more intelligent than the reading audience. So that we're really impressed with their verbiage, the fact that they have such a great vocabulary. And all it does is cloud the true meaning behind what they are trying to say. Now, I did something in the manuscript I'm going to mention right here is that I, I did something different than what a lot of the brethren are doing. I didn't start my manuscript with the beginning of the book. I started it with the end of the book, but there's a reason. In the section that they call the epilogue, it's entitled, Why Didn't You Talk About? And then, of course, the question mark. And then list virtually every major issue that is in need of being addressed in a book on worship. From instrumental music to hand clapping to charismatic body, mo charismatic body movements, they explain it away, why they didn't cover it. First they said, well, we didn't have the space. Actually, they had quite a bit of space. They could have done away with all the previous chapters and started talking about these things. But then they added this. They are all secondary to the focus of this book. Assembly as a transforming sacramental encounter that calls us to participate in the mission of God is the foundation for discussing all other questions about the assembly. It is, according to them, the weightier matter. On the next page, they write, we realize, of course, that our position regarding the assembly as a sacramental encounter is itself controversial though it is the historic position of the church. Really. One must ask what Bible passage they're referring to when they say that this transforming is the way to your matter. With all the Bible tools at hand, I couldn't find it. The one Bible passage that uses the term transforming says far more about the three authors of this book than it does about the support of their doctrine. Because it says, for such are false prophets, deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. 13. When the Bible speaks about being transformed, it is not through some subjective charismatic encounter with God what happens as a result of our study of the word of God. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, Romans 12, 2. The real reason these men have not addressed these other doctrinal issues in their book 
seems to me to be that they hope their subjective emotion-based spin will make a further discussion unnecessary. The thrust of the book is to turn worship away from an objective, rational, taught and learned obedience to God and make it into a touchy-feely encounter. One cannot help but wonder what error the likes of Hicks, Melton, and Valentine will not embrace. As I was reading the book, it seemed to me that they never met an error they didn't like. Just a few of the errors that I encountered in this book include error on the Holy Spirit, Calvinism, the emerging church movement, everything we do in life is worship, charismatic worship forms, and human standards for worship. Now, it's not all that thick a book. And it didn't cost $119.95. But then again, any money that I spent on it, I would sure love to get back because I don't, I don't, I'd rather not have it in my library, but I've got it now. In many ways, the destructive Pentecostal doctrines of Mac Deaver are being espoused by these men, even though in a previous time, Mac wouldn't have been in fellowship with them. It's evident that these three men have many of the same extra literary views of the Holy Spirit that Mac does. Concerning the Lord's Supper, they say it's an authentic communion with God through Christ in the power of the Spirit. Concerning the worship assembly, through the Spirit we enter the heavenly Jerusalem where we share the future with all the saints gathered around the world and spread throughout time. Through the Spirit, the assembly mediates to us the eschatological assembly of God's people around the throne that transcends time and space. You know, when I read that last sentence, my first thought was, well, beam me up, Scotty. Because <laughs> that's science fiction. That's not Bible. These flights of fancy, these false views of the Holy Spirit. They further state the spirit in our assemblies mediates our worship to God. And God's presence unveils the re relational dynamic of the worship assembly itself. You know, there are a lot of people that seem to believe that the Spirit mediates in some way, but that's, that's not scriptural. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, Paul writes, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, if, unless words don't mean what they say, then the only mediator we have is Christ. Even their view of the role of the Spirit goes against what Jesus said. First, they indicate that one's worship in, one does worship in the Spirit in the modern world in the same way that John was in the Spirit in the book of Revelation. They suggest when the Spirit or when the people of God assemble on the earth, they are no longer in a particular place or time. Now that's that same thing that they mentioned earlier. Instead, they are in the Spirit. They transcend space and time as they are lifted by the Spirit into the heavenly sanctuary. Now, they use the phrase in the Spirit in a completely erroneous fashion. Many times in the Bible, this phrase is used in the New Testament to refer to the Spirit of man. Paul wrote in Colossians 2.5, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the Spirit joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Sometimes the same phrase is used as a metaphor. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5.25. The one time in the Scriptures that the Spirit is addressed on the Lord's Day is Revelation 1.10, where John wrote, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. But even in this case, it's talking about a miraculous representation of the Spirit through the visions that John saw on that day. There is no suggestion at all that the Holy Spirit either initiates or participates in worship today. Of course, I guess the question I want to know is, does God worship God? Their view of the Spirit goes against what Jesus said the role of the Spirit was on the earth. 
They say, indeed, the primary work of the Spirit is presence. Not gifts, but presence, being present. God dwelling in his people and communing with them. Now, Jesus taught us what the primary work of the Holy Spirit was in one of his last conversations with the apostles. In John chapter 16, uh, starting in verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's expedient for you that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. The Holy Spirit is called several times in this conversation the Spirit of Truth. And his primary task was giving them the gospel. And through the gospel would judge the world. Keep in mind that Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judges him. The words that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. Since the word will be our judge, it's that word that the Holy Spirit will use to reprove the world. It's not without reason that the Lord taught about the whole armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17 and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. These men also espouse Calvinism, similar to Calvin's total hereditary depravity doctrine where man cannot approach God unless God first initiates it. In worship, according to Hicks and company, the Spirit initiates and enables our praise at the same time, brings to our heart the delight and joy of God's own communion. And they refer to this as the dynamic work of the Spirit, which brings us to God, and it, it also brings God to us. In a similar way, we're seeing a strong charismatic shift today among the denominations many of which began with a very dogmatic and ritualized worship practices, but have now become much looser in the way they do things. They use bands, rock and roll bands even, and in hymnody, and use contemporary styles and informal dress and almost a coffee house atmosphere, along with big screen TVs and other visually exciting venues, common in most of the traditional denominations today because they now are teaching a doctrine that is better felt than told. In order to keep their postmodern derived worship styles, they seek to justify themselves by denigrating the old paths of first century Christianity. In one such section, Hicks and company equate the so-called five acts of worship that's familiar to us all with a form of institutional racism saying, well, perhaps the sharpest example of the narrow orthodoxy produced by this theology is the hundreds of congregations that were deemed sound and faithful because they scrupulously performed five acts of authorized worship while excluding African Americans from their assemblies. Now, I don't know if there is still a vestige of institutional racism in the church in this country, but that's a very unfair comparison. A church is not deemed merely, sound merely because they participate in the authorized five acts of worship. As a matter of fact, I'd bet most of us know of unsound congregations that practice the exact same five acts of worship that we do, but are unsound in a lot of other ways. This has never been the only criteria for soundness. In another argument, they suggest that what we do was not founded in the Bible, but in the American Restoration Movement. They suggest that the five acts were handed down to us through the Reformed tradition 
and Scottish independence that formed Alexander Campbell's own personal views. Then they add, culture influenced the exercise of these acts when we stopped using wine on the table because of the temperance movement. I guess we need to just throw out 160 years of scholarship in studying authorized worship in the scriptures because that's not the real reason we do it today, according to Hicks and company. Or could it be that we actually have Bible for those things? Could it be that the fruit of the vine is enjoined simply because leaven was to be removed entirely from the house during the Passover, according to Deuteronomy 16, and that would include the yeast that makes the wine alcoholic? Could it be that we're commanded to take the Lord's Supper by example on the first day of the week, Acts 20 and verse 7, and take up a collection on that same day, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2? Could it be that prayer and singing were also enjoined in the scriptures according to Colossians 3, 16, 1 Corinthians 14, 15, and others? Could it be that gospel preaching was also involved? Acts 20 and verse 7. Was it really just Campbell's own personal views or the teaching of God's own word? Once they've attempted to refute all five authorized acts of worship, they try to finish it off completely with this statement. Rather than being timelessly written in stone, the five acts paradigm is culturally dependent and theologically deficient. Frankly, if anything is truly theologically deficient, it's this book. Now, you know, just when I thought that they had covered it all, I found that they also espoused, per Buster Dobbs, the everything we do in life is worship except for sin. They approach this belief by suggesting that the so-called discipleship is more important than worship, saying vain worship occurs when discipleship is subverted. Obedience to God in all aspects of life is the Christian's act of worship. Well, first, the Lord didn't say or teach in his word that vain worship happens when discipleship is subverted. Rather, he said, but in vain they do worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of man. Matthew 5, 15, verse 9. The worship system, or lack thereof, espoused by Hicks, Melton, and Valentine would indeed be vain worship. Of course, the proof text they try to use is the New International Version, which has in Romans 12, verse, verse 1 and 2, Therefore I urge you, brothers, to, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Now, you know, many have tried to take that Greek word, latreia, and make it mean worship. But isn't it interesting that in all five verses in which that word shows up in the, in the King James Version of the Bible, it's translated service. Of course, there's another kind of interesting fact, and that's the fact that the other four verses in the NIV also translated service. The primary meaning, according to dictionaries that I have and looked up, simply refers to a rendered service of some kind. Quite literally. Now, you know, I don't, I'm not a great Bible scholar like Brother Denham as far as uh, the Greek and the Hebrew and whatnot, but I can use a vines and I can use a strongs and, and I can use a thayers and a berries and a number of these other things and, and find out the meaning of a word. But I also know that one of the principles of translation is to always try to use the primary meaning of a word unless context forces a different meaning. And why in this context force this word to refer to worship rather than service? We should also remember that all worship is service, but all service is not worship. Otherwise, I could go play golf on the Lord's Day and just call it worship. We'll stop over here at the ninth, ninth hole and have our, have our cracker and our grape juice and we'll just say we're worshiping God. Then you get into the charismatic type of things that they're involved in. And this really is at the heart is postmodernism. Anything goes 
They have a chapter called Contemporary Gatherings, Assembly Worthy of the Gospel. Now, the first thing they do is try to take away the regulatory nature of God-approved worship, suggesting instead that the text of the New Testament is a set of occasional writings rather than legal briefs that set out the rules for assembly. Now, that's very similar to the liberal notion that the Bible is simply a love letter and not a set of laws. Taken to extreme, this idea leaves the worshiper to do anything he desires, as long as it, he does it in the human perception of the glory of God. Of course, we need to remember that the things that glorify God are the things that God says give him glory, and not just anything we want to do. The Hicks bunch even misuses a favored Bible passage and attempts to revision that. In John 4, verse 23 and 24, which we read a few moments ago, it talks about the true worshiper. Well, according to Hicks and Melton and, and Valentine, the true worshiper isn't you and I. It's Jesus. They give it a prophetic spin. They say Jesus is the incarnate God, is the image of God, the true Israel, the true human. He is the true worshiper who enables us to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And then secondly, they stipulate that the spirit mentioned here and elsewhere never in the Gospel of John refers to sincerity and inner human attitudes. It's of interest that they limited it to the book of John rather than the rest of the scriptures. It's almost as though they would suggest that all the various books of the Bible are completely standalone and are not the product of the Holy Spirit. In Romans 1, 9, we read, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Instead, they view as referring to the Holy Spirit, even to the point of suggesting that the living water referred to by Jesus in verse 14 of John 4 is the Holy Spirit himself. They say the living water within us is the dynamic presence of the Spirit through whom we experience the reality. All this leads up to their take on the truth. One of the uses of this word in John 4, 24, they say this. The context of John 4 is not truth, as in biblical ideas, versus falsehood, as in unscriptural ideas, but rather reality versus shadow. They add all these ideas together to say to worship the Father in spirit and in truth then is to praise the Father in his new temple in the power of the Spirit. They go farther toward taking the authority of the scriptures completely out of the things that we're commanded to do when they address this reference to Jesus. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And they state that the phrase does not mean by the authority of Jesus. Of course, once again, that's not true. To do something in someone's name is to use their authority. As we see in passages like Acts 4, verse 7, when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or authority or by what name have ye done this? They recognized the principle of authority. Now, after this discussion, they state it's not only a response with our lips, but our bodies as well involves the whole person. Now, they then give a list of the things that they suggest are appropriate scriptural practices of worship, literally postures of worship. They include bending the knee, bowing the head, raising the hands, prostrating oneself on the ground, clapping hands, standing, sitting, and even dancing. It's kind of interesting the passage of scripture they use to, to verify that. It doesn't refer to dancing at all, but rather to leaping. These are all part of charismatic teachings of Pentecostalism, and it implies an anything-goes worship style that will just go wherever the so-called spirit moves. Did you ever notice that in this day and age, everything we do gets blamed on someone else? It's either, like Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it, or I was moved by the spirit. Well, then what are we responsible for? 
In the final chapter of the book, there's a great deal of effort by Hicks, Melton, and Valentine to use human reasoning to allow for a wide variety of worship styles. In one suggestion, they said this, and they were talking about, of course, we remember 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and all the discussion there about worship on into chapter 14. And he says, Corinth was to limit their tongue speakers to only two or three persons. But Paul doesn't necessarily limit Ephesus to only two or three. Well, you know, the last time I read concerning this matter, 1 Corinthians 4, 4 and verse 17, Paul says, for this cause I have sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son, and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. These three go on to suggest that cultural differences allow for worship differences. You know, in all of this, one thing seems to ring through, and that's the entire concept of unity and diversity. The suggestion of these three men, Hicks, Melton, and Valentine, is that we should expect and accept different types of worship in different places. Brethren, they are not the spiritual heirs of Stone and Campbell. They are the spiritual heirs of Ketcherside, Shelley, and Lakedo. In fact, cultural differences have proven to, to, to not to cause such differences. I've been making regular trips to England over the past few years, and one of the congregations that we typically go to in, in the uh, kind of the northeast corner of, of London, in the Thamesmead area, has, was mostly made of, of immigrants from Nigeria, Liberia, and Ghana, Kind of interesting, though, they sing the same songs, they pray the same way, they sing the same way, and they worship the same way that we do. This book, A Gathered People, The Assembly as Transforming Encounter, is indeed a profile in apostasy. And I know that between this lesson and Brother Jeans, we're going to cover the Hicks Bunch pretty thoroughly this morning. Thank you. Don't forget your bottle. <laughs> I say that because I keep one up here most of the time. Wish I'd had it yesterday morning. That is an excellent lesson. We appreciate very much the effort put forth and the way it was presented and exposing the error that's in this book. He said uh, part of the problem nowadays, we blame something. That is our problems or our errors on somebody else. Oh, we blame it on you know, the spirit made me do it. Back in the 1950s, the late G.K. Wallace was in a gospel meeting in eastern Arkansas. And he was relatively close to the building, so he walked that Sunday morning, pretty morning, and decided to walk to the building. And he said on the way to the building, so the fellow approached him and asked him if he were a Christian. And he said, well, yes, I'm a Christian. He said, in fact, I'm a gospel preacher, and I'm beginning today a gospel meeting at such and such church of Christ down here. And he embarrassed the fellow a little bit, and he said, well, the Spirit told me to come over here and, and speak to you. And Brother Wallace looked at him and said, the Holy Spirit knows I'm a Christian because I was baptized for the remission of sins in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There must be some other ghost after you. <laughs> And that's as good an answer as I can think to give to any of these fellows. When you go back to Ezra, Nehemiah, you have a record of the Jews coming back, a remnant, from the Babylonian captivity to that area of Palestine, Judah and so forth, Jerusalem. And they set about to put everything back together like God wanted. Now, how do you think they were going to do that? That is, put things back as God wanted it. Well, they had to go find God's will. That's the only place I know that you can find out anything as far as what God wants. And that was the law of Moses for them. That's how Israel approached. God was under the law of Moses. And if you read Ezra and Nehemiah, you will see that once they found the law, then they knew just by having it, it wouldn't do any good. They had to read it, study it, understand it, and make the application. 
And that meant some changes among people. And you read quite a bit of change there as to even uh, what the law taught and where they had married the wrong people. And they even talked about uh, Nehemiah pulling people's hair and contending with them. I suppose he did that in love and uh, getting them back to the law. There's also material that talks about he's had cycle battles. That's simply the language of Ashdod. And if you don't know what that means, we preachers need to preach more on it. In fact, I was thinking, I, uh, when I sat over here before I came up here, what you said about that, just, it just clicked. I said, I'm just going to go back and do a series of lessons on the language of Ashdod and what that means. So if you don't know about the language of Ashdod, that simply tells me you haven't been reading your Old Testament. We stand dismissed top of the hour. And by the way, the ladies have a class. Sister Fogel will be teaching it back here. Thank you.